This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental justice. Human rights China issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition Accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. Anna Julia Cooper and W.E. Du Bois didn't have access to the internet, to a 24-hour news cycle, or even talk radio. What they did have access to were newspapers, journals, and magazines, the mass media of the day. The mass media of today is, in fact, broadband and 24-hour news channels and a range of other media platforms that allow intellectuals, black intellectuals like Melissa Harris Perry and Mark Lamont Hill to be the most visible black intellectuals that we've seen in generations. Both join us today on Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, your host. Welcome back to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined this afternoon by Melissa Harris Perry, professor of political science at Tulane University and the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Project on Gender, Race, and Politics in the South. She's the author of several books, including Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk, and Black Political Talk, and the brand new book, Sister Citizen. Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. That's Yale University Press 2011. How are you doing this afternoon, Melissa? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm sorry I can't actually be in Durham with you. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, this, this is your old stomping ground Absolutely. here in Durham. And, and so we're, we're so happy to have you on the show. Uh, let me just start by saying about, you know, at least everyone here in this community is, is very much proud of all of your success um, these last couple of years. And, and you know, part of it has been your ongoing willingness as, as a commentator to keep the voices of black women and the experiences of black women firmly centered in the work that you do. Um, and of course, this is brilliantly shown in the new book, Sister Citizen. You, you make the point earlier in the book about this notion of black women in politics. And, and, and when you're talking politics, you're not talking elected officials. You know, we're not going to get a chapter on, on Condoleezza Rice necessarily. But this idea that there are, uh, there are black women's trauma, there are these things that are internalized that are very political, right? And you try to give voice to those partic particular aspects of black women's politics. Talk a little bit about your thinking in terms of working through the ideas of this book. Sure, so, you know, it's funny that you say, it, you know, that it's not about elected officials, that we don't have the, the chapter on Condoleezza Rice, because that's the book that I initially meant to write yeah, and, yeah. and had every intention of writing. And in fact, I have just shelves worth of, uh, of research on Condoleezza Rice because I had every intention of writing a chapter <laughs> about her. Um, and, and so that book is still in me and, and very well may yet come out. But in trying to write initially about African American women and traditional politics and elected, you know, running for elected office, holding appointed office, you know, doing the work of, of addressing uh, resource disparities mm -hmm. through community organizing. I kept running into a set of questions that had to emerge and be dealt with first before I could move on to the kind of traditional political questions. And those first questions were you know, only political in the broadest sense of what counts as politics, in other words, power and right. our role as citizens, um, but really not, you know, the kind of politics, for example, that I talk about on TV, which is about electoral contests. Right. So, right. so Sister Citizen really was, um, you know, was a book that started as one thing and turned into something else because I ultimately felt like I couldn't yet talk about black women as fully political figures mm -hmm. until I spent mm -hmm. a little bit of time trying to research and ask about black women as human persons yeah. first. One of the things you talk about in the book is, is this myth of the strong black woman. Um, and, and, and you identify it as a misrecognition of black women. Uh, and, and you're talking about recognition and very, very much in political science sensibilities, but recognition as a kind of basis for citizenship. Talk about the struggles of black women to be understood as fully citizen, right? Even after there's been obviously, the, you know, these centuries battles over this idea of black citizenship, we still see women, black women sort of outside, you know, of that conversation, even within black communities. Sure. So. Uh 
You know, I think when we think about citizenship and we think about the role of the state, particularly during an election year, mm -hmm. um, we really do imagine initially that it's about resources, um, that citizens ask for certain kinds of resources from the state. The state has a responsibility to provide certain kinds of resources to its citizens. But uh, Hannah Arendt and other um, political theorists reminded us that resources are only one part of why we engage in a democratic project. The other part of it is this notion, maybe, maybe it it is in, in itself is a kind of democratic myth, but the idea that in a democracy we will be accurately seen for who we are yeah. Yeah. in the public sphere, that there is, there's actually a human pleasure that comes from engaging in the public sphere and having people look at us and, and accurately see who we are. And the groups that are marginalized, um, whether they're marginalized by race, by gender, by sexual orientation, um, by all of the things that we think of as, as being outside of the norm of mm -hmm. the American citizen, much less if, as a, for example, queer black woman, you are all of those marginal identities, then the, the, the likelihood that when you enter into the public sphere, you will be accurately recognized, mm -hmm. accurately seen for who you are, is vanishingly small. Yeah. And in fact, the, the vast majority of the public experiences then that black women have is of being mi misrecognized, is right. being characterized as the Mammy or the Jezebel, or in the context of black communities, where there may be kind of loving misrecognitions rather than, uh, rather than angry misrecognitions, but it's still like this strong black woman who it's no big deal for her to give over everything inside of herself in order to serve her community, her children, her, her, her spouse, you know, her church. This idea that there's no cost to black women who are placed in that role is undoubtedly a misrecognition even if their behavior demonstrates that they are yeah. extraordinarily strong. I mean, let's talk about this in another context. The Washington Post this week just started running a series of articles on, on the experiences of black women. Um, you know from your own work, you know, working particularly in terms of, of, of popular media, about this ongoing narrative that we've been examining for the last three years about black women as being unmarriable, this idea of the angry black woman. What is, in fact, the cultures, and not just black culture in this case, but the broader culture Cultures, fascination at this moment with, you know, the the, the lives of black women, and, and not really the quality of their lives, but right. but just as kind of a, something to go at and, and to pull apart and, and 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 try to examine. What is this moment about in terms of black women's lives? I think the language you're using there, this kind of dissection language, yeah, that, yeah. that that we'd look at them, we'd observe them, we take them apart piece by piece. You know, I write in Sister Citizen a little bit about how uh, initially when Michelle Obama came onto the public stage, we engaged in a public dissection of her body. We would talk right. about her right. derriere, right. we would talk about her arms, You're literally pulling her apart and thinking about the pieces of who she is. Yeah. And, and we see this in, you know, the resurgence of the nostalgic mammy uh, in the help. I mean, the fact, yeah. there is no, there's no doubt that um, the help with all of its uh, Academy Award nominations and this Washington Post series on let's look at the black woman through survey data right. and, you know, Nightline all of a sudden being worried about whether or not black women can find husbands and asking Steve Harvey <laughs> to help us. I mean, th these things are all part of, you know, a cultural moment that yeah. undoubtedly you as a, an astute cultural observer can see. But they're not just cultural, they're also deeply political. Mm -hmm. They're about yeah. power. And that if we take the group with the fewest um, economic and academic and social and political resources and uh, subject that group to scrutiny, then we can pathologize that group in a way that is ego protective for everybody else. If it's really just black women and their sexual and personal and intellectual and spiritual failings that put them in this lower position, then everybody else can feel okay because as long as you're doing better than black women right. and as long as there's some mammy out there whose whole <laughs> life is really just to help you find your way, <laughs> then, then, then we can all feel better about this economic transition that we're in the midst of.
You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are, of course, joined this afternoon by Melissa Harris-Perry, author of the new book, Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America, longtime contributor to MSNBC, soon to be host of her own weekend show on MSNBC. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, one of the things, and one of the great metaphors that you use in the book, Melissa, is this idea of the crooked room. And, and, and black women walk into this crooked room and are trying to read through the space in order to find some sort of grounding. And inevitably, you know, part of the process is to argue that there's some, I'm the one who's crooked, there's something wrong with me. And you talk about this within the context of shame. And, 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 and I remember hearing you talk about this idea of shame, it was probably going back three or four years ago, and, and thinking to myself, it's a wonderful thing to bring into our conversation because it shows not only the way that black women are now policed by the broader culture, but when that shame is internalized within black communities, black communities become as complicit in this process of policing black women in this context. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when I think about some of the most shaming experiences I've had in popular culture, you know, I mean, occasionally they occur um, as a result of things like the Super Bowl commercials where, right. you know, black women are presented as ultra angry and that kind of thing. But but honestly, it, it's really every single time a Tyler Perry movie is um, <laughs> is released. And whether it is the kind of obvious buffoonery of Medea or the more insidious um, kind of uh, narrowly defined Christian moral mm -hmm. tales that, that mm -hmm. are his other version of his films, mm -hmm. or even if it is the kind of obscene rendition of for colored girls, right? I mean, literally every time a Tyler Perry movie is released, and I have to walk around with this this last name that I really, I really <laughs> love, you know, Perry. <laughs> but I have great, you know, I have great shame as a, as, a, as a result. And, you know, you've heard me talk about it, obviously it's in the book, but these shaming responses are physiological, they are psychological, and they are political. And they, they can actually ask us, they lead to, to circumstances in our body and in our body politic where we want to withdraw from activism, where we want to withdraw from engagement with the public sphere. Because shaming is an extraordinarily painful yeah. human emotion. More yeah. painful in certain ways even than sadness is because it, re it, it means that we're, we're profoundly exposed. And again, because black women are observed and dissected uh, and reduced in so many ways, that exposure yeah. can be uh, constant and very painful. And you talk about it in a, in a broader context also, this idea of Jim Crow really being the kind of systematic state-sponsored racial shaming that takes place. And, and one of the things that I, I enjoyed that you did with the book, and, and, and quite frankly thankful that you addressed in the book, you know, is talking about shame within the context of the Duke Lacrosse case, and, and particularly the Duke 88. I, I think one of the things that as many folks have thought about what this case represents, and, and you know, six-year anniversary, um, of, of the actual quote-unquote event, that one of the things that gets missed in, in all these conversations is the, really the impact that it's had on black women faculty who happen to stand out and be very outspoken about what they felt this case about, what they thought the implications were, and, and the kind of attacks that they got that were ongoing. I mean, ongoing and systematic, I mean, even six years later. And, and it was so refreshing to be able to read about shame within the context of this broader case and, and in the context of talking about what kind of impact it physiologically has, psychologically, intellectually has on black women when they choose actually to, to think outside the, outside the box, if you will, about yeah, black political issues. Yeah, writing about the Duke case was, was very important for me. You know, obviously I'm a, I've got my PhD at Duke right. and um, I watch what was happening with the Duke 88. And look, many of us who had been trained at Duke were junior faculty members at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were on, you know, we were on listservs, we were emailing each other and saying, what should we do? Should we take a stand? Should we sign on? Uh, and so many of our fac you know, senior faculty members and people who had been our dissertation advisors were telling right. us, stay, stay out away. of it. Yeah. Do not come <laughs> over here. You know, yeah. we've got it. They, they, in fact, they were both, both white, you know, for, there were white men who were part of, you know, the Duke 88 as well, who, who received some of this. Right, um, Bill Chafe and... Yeah, and Bill Chafe, for example. Peter Woods, yeah. Public abuse. And, 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 you know, they told us at the time, stay out of it. And so, you know, when the book was released, you know, more than five years later, I had a chance to not stay out of it, but to get into mm -hmm. it. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's part of my goal in the book, is to push us beyond 
uh, imagining that personal experiences and personal circumstances are solely and exclusively personal. Um, but doing, you know, what I think of as the great feminist work, which is to talk about how these personal and micro experiences are actually political. And precisely this issue of state-sponsored shaming in the context of Jim Crow, we're watching the GOP return to yeah. the language of uh, shaming in, in, the, in the primary season around this kind of food stamp president narrative. Um, and, but, but the Duke case is emblematic of how other institutional forms can engage in these kind of institutional shaming uh, of African-American women and how cathartic it is for yeah. other people to have a chance to shame black women in this way. Absolutely. I, I want to stay on the G GOP thing for a moment, you, you know, because one of the things that strikes me about all of this kind of racial rhetoric that we're hearing is, is that it's almost, you know, constructed in a way to force President Obama to own race in ways that he's largely been unwilling to in, in a very public, that, you know, that, that the rhetoric is so, uh, you know, insulting, it, it is so racist, if you will, that even someone like President Obama would have to, at some point, publicly have to push back against this and then it becomes tethered to race in ways that, you know, he has, I think, resisted so far in his presidency. Well, you know, look, political science hat off and, you know, kind of <laughs> campaign um, uh, uh, professional hat on. And, and the fact is, actually, I think that it, it has the opposite impact. When the GOP uses language, it's not just dog whistles, but, you know, hmm fire sirens at this point <laughs> that are clearly about racial narratives, I actually think they free the president from having to discuss race. Wow. He can yeah. actually kind of do his universal narrative. Nothing rallies African-American voters like the attacks on, on yeah. blacks yeah. by the right. Or it doesn't even have to be the right. I mean, you know, I talk about it a bit in the book. When, um, when African Americans perceived O.J. Simpson as being attacked, when they perceived um, uh, Mike Tyson as being attacked, when they perceived R. Kelly as being attacked, whenever you have particularly an African American man right. who appears to be the, um, you know, taking the brunt of what are clearly racialized attacks by the other side, man, you, you, don't, you don't have to do another thing to get people signed up to vote. That right, will, right, you know, right. Local candidates are always looking for that moment. They're hoping to get um, the attack from the, from the white candidate because it means they no longer have to talk about race because that dog whistle, that racism emerges on the other on side. The side right, right. Um, so in many ways, I actually think that it's, it's unfortunate because it means the president doesn't have to have a proactive conversation about race, as long as it can be simply reactive, you know, sort of standing there and saying, hey, look at all this racism coming at me. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stand here and, mm -hmm. and, and, and try to, um, you know, govern universally. Absolutely. I, I, I would ask you what's next for you, Melissa, but everybody, of course, knows what's next for you. <laughs> uh, you will begin uh, next weekend, is it, or, or two weekends from now, um, your stint as a, a weekend anchor on MSNBC, weekend host. Talk a little bit about what this transition means for you in, in terms of trying to balance this with obviously your academic career, but also what it means for the future of having much more of a presence of, of African Americans, and in particular African American women, um, in mainstream uh, news media. Well, sure. I mean, you know, again, it's kind of the best of times, worst of times. We've been talking about all the, the struggles of African-American women in the public sphere. But this is also a moment when an African-American woman owns her own network, right? Oprah right. Winfrey, right. where um, Gail King is uh, on a morning show it's during CBS the week. Today. Yeah. Right, um, where uh, Soledad O'Brien now has the morning show again uh, on cable on, on CNN. And now I've got a, a morning show on the weekends on MSNBC. I mean, that's, the, that's, yeah. that's pretty historic, yeah. right? Yeah. One might look back at... 2012 and remember this not as a year of uh, kind of the oppressive realities of uh, American myth making around black women, but all of the stunning ways in which African American women are making some new um, some new points of entry. Now that said, I think that the most dangerous thing that you can do um, in a position of, of privilege is to believe that your access is equal to mm -hmm. access for your identity group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's not. It, you know, right. even if, if Gail and Soledad and Oprah and me and how hilarious that I get to be part of that group, <laughs> or even if you know, even if we all have TV shows, that doesn't change in and of itself the material conditions mm -hmm. for the vast majority of African American women living in the United States. So I think we have to be aware of that. And look, you know, what does this mean for my academic career? I, I hope not much in the sense right, that right. 
Um, I, I am very clear that even wildly successful television shows, you know, they last somewhere from two to, to five years or something right. like that. Right. I mean, you know, right. what what is a wildly successful television career? Um, and you know, I, I don't know about you, Mark, but one of the reasons I became a college professor is because we can do this job until we are a hundred and ninety years old. <laughs> they never kick us off campus. We get to wander around and think big thoughts. You know, I think about John Hope Franklin writing yeah, yeah, uh, until right. his last days. Right. Uh, and in, in a very real way, all of my ego eggs are still in the academic basket. Absolutely. Uh, I can so. probably fail spectacularly at the cable news thing and I'll still feel fine as long as I feel like I am a respected academic but even if I win a hundred thousand Emmy Awards which which isn't gonna happen but even if I did um, and became a top rated show but I felt like my colleagues thought that my contributions were um, thin or stupid the fact is I probably would, would feel like a terrible failure and that is of course the terrible mind game that the academy plays on us during yeah. our phd yeah. years is now all my ego eggs are in the basket of what do my political science and african-american studies right. colleagues think about me it's it's really it's sort of sad i should probably get therapy or something <laughs> <laughs> we've been joined this afternoon by professor melissa harris perry who's the author of the new book, Sister Citizens, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. That's Yale University Press, 2011. She is professor of political science at Tulane University, where she's also the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Project on Gender, Race, and Politics in the South. Thank you very much for taking some time out of your busy schedule, Melissa. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Take care. My name is Mumi Abu-Jamal. I'm uh, on death row in Pennsylvania. Um, ex-president of the Association of Black Journalists in Philadelphia. I'm still a continuing revolutionary journalist. I write for anybody who wants me to write for them. Um, and I'm fighting my conviction, fighting the sentence, fighting for my life, and fighting to create revolution in America. Welcome back to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. And our guest this afternoon really doesn't need an introduction. <laughs> Everybody knows who Mark Lamont Hill is, Associate Professor of Education at Teachers College at Columbia University, the author of several books, including the recent Hip Hop Classroom uh, Beats, Rhymes, and Classroom Life, Hip Hop Pedagogy and the Politics of Identity, and a new book, The Classroom in the Cell, Conversations on Black Life, which Mark, you co-wrote with me, Abu Jamal. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. And, and we're really excited, of course, to, to talk about this book. Um, in some ways, and you talk a little bit about this in the book, that Mumia Abu Jamal may be one of the most recognizable black public intellectuals, if not intellectuals in general, over the last 20 years. Um, yet he's been in an incarcerated state during that period of time, uh, the large majority of it on death row. Um, talk a little bit about your initial fascination with me, Abu Jamal. I remember in the early days of your blog, going back a decade ago, um, this was something that you were very clearly focused and concerned about, uh, the incarceral state and the way someone like Mumi Abu Jamal really gave voice to, to what that reality was. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, um, for me, Mumi is both a personal and an intellectual kind of project. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia just like he did. We both born and raised in North Philadelphia, so uh, I always had a connection to Mumia. I always knew about his case. I always knew who he was and what he represented. You know, one of my earliest memories, um, I was born in 78, so one of my earliest memories was the move bombing. 1985, of 1985. yeah. Yeah, man, you know, and I had family in, in Southwest Philly, West Philly, Powton Village, you know, from the 78 bombing, too. So, you know, for me, my family experience, my experience in Philadelphia, my first exposure to police terrorism, all these things were connected to MOVE and also to Mamiya, who was covering MOVE at the time in 78. And ultimately, you know, by 85, he was incarcerated, but still intimately connected to the project. So I was always aware of what Mamiya was doing. I was always aware of who he was. And I always kept asking myself the question, what is it about this man that causes the state mm. to be so committed to his incarceration? Yeah. I mean, it, it, was, it was just a question that always lingered with me. Uh, the more I studied the case, the more I saw the holes in it, the more I saw uh, the need for a new trial, um, and I ultimately came to believe that he wasn't just legally not guilty, you know, but also he was factually innocent. Um, and that made me connect him even more. And then I began to read his work. Um, this is Mumia's seventh book. 
right. you know, so right. which is right. <laughs> more than a lot of our colleagues, right? You know, right. You know and, and this is Mumia's seventh book. Um, the other six, you know, were solo authored, you know, deeply researched, footnoted, you know, close readings of text, deep, so, you know, sociocultural analysis. I mean, Mumia is a brilliant man, and he's also deeply committed to freedom fighting. And yeah. to see those two things connected is what makes him such a profound and powerful public intellectual, and it's what connected me uh, to Mumia. The idea of writing a book with him didn't even uh, really cross my mind. I initially connected with Mumia in 2008 on a personal level. I was still over at Fox News. It was right. It was before the uh, the Democratic uh, primary uh, mm -hmm. had been had concluded, and so Hillary and Barack were still going at it. And I was on Fox. I was getting hammered on Fox. I was getting hammered by everybody. White people were mad at me. You know, black people were mad at me. Whatever I critiqued <laughs> at that time, Senator Obama. You know, right. so I was getting it from everywhere. And I remember getting this phone call. And it came up, and I saw the area, the Pennsylvania area code, and I knew it was the prison. Right, going, right. Yeah, I know the prison. <laughs> you know, I know right. prison extensions. <laughs> and I assumed at the time my brother was locked up, you know, uh, cousins, everybody. So I just kept ignoring it. I was like, it's just somebody that wants something. You know, I'm not going to answer it. And as the day went on, I kept seeing this call emerge, and I was so exhausted from the day and the beating I was getting in the media that I just kept ignoring it. And finally at 8 o'clock, man, I, like, picked up the phone, I answered it, and it was like, you have a collect call from a, a, a member of a person of you know Pennsylvania Correctional Institution. And you're thinking family, right? right. I'm thinking it's cousin Ray Ray Peanut, somebody, somebody else, you know, and it's like, the caller is Mumia Abu Jamal. Right, and you know that voice from all the radio recordings that he's done. I mean, it's just a distinctive voice. It's like. Exactly. <laughs> I would have thought it was a prank call if it hadn't had the whole prison intro. I, I, so I just start pushing five as quick as I can to, to get the call through. And, and Mumia is as cool as a fan, you know, old school Philly cool, you know what I mean? So right, he's right. just like. Yo, yo, what's up, man? What's up, young buck? I was like, um, <laughs> what's up? I'm, this wasn't the call I saw coming, you know? And uh, he just he just sent love, man, and said, you know, I um, he said, I want you to know that, you know, I, I, I've been watching your work. I've been seeing you in the media, um, and I appreciate the fight you're taking. I know you're taking a beating from everybody. I mean, the call came like perfect timing for what yeah. I was going through there, yeah. and everything. And he was like, you know, but I want you to know I appreciate the work. Then the next thing he said to me was, you think he going to do it? He didn't have to say who he was or what do it meant. He just said, you think you're going to do it? I was like, I don't know, bro. He may, he may not. And over the course of that conversation and then the next week and the next week, we kept talking about Obama and whether he could do it. And at that time, doing it just meant beating Hillary. Right, you know? right, right. Then after that, we started watching the, the, the horse races throughout the summer, seeing if he could get through McCain, watching everything. And by the time we got to November, we had spent just weeks talking about Obama, talking about whether or not he could win, and talking about what it meant for him to win, what was at stake for a win, whether a win was even what we wanted, you know? And that's how our conversations began. And after a while, every Friday at 530 were just our conversations. And they started to spread from just politics to culture. And, right, and then right. he was just talking about growing up in Philly. Then he would ask me what, what Philly looks like, you know? You know. And then he, he, we started talking about our families and our children. And then that Christmas, I got a hand-painted birthday card from him. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and I, I didn't have to remind him of my birthday or anything like that. He just remembered. And, uh, and I got to see a more personal side of him over the course of time as well. Um, and after a while, I said to him, you know, we talk about all this stuff. We talk all this stuff. You just finished your book, Jailhouse Lawyers. I just finished Beach Rhymes and Classroom. Like, why don't we work on a book together? together. Yeah. yeah. So we started writing it. And uh, we wrote like a, a piece and a chapter here, a chapter there. Um, and we kept trying to meld our voices. And after a while, we realized that we were doing it all backwards. You know, it was like the, the, I think the, the thing about our conversations that was special was our respective positionalities and the fact yeah. that. And that gets lost in, in, in doing a text together, right? Exactly. You know, sharing your narrative the same way. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. So we said if the conversation is what's drawing us here and this was animating this whole project, then let's make this a book of conversations. Other people have certainly done it. You know, we saw Margaret Mead and, and James Baldwin do a rap on race. We saw, of course, Cornel Weston Bell. Bell Hooks Breaking Bread, yeah. I, I mean, I was struck when you mentioned very early in the book, it's thinking about both the Mead and Baldwin conversation, but particularly Bell Hooks and Cornel West. And, and go back to when that book is published in 1991, mm -hmm. and, and there really is not even a public language to talk about black intellectuals at that time. Right. And they have this extraordinary conversation about what it is to live a life of the mind. And it's interesting that you draw back to that and come forward. And, and so now we're imagining in 2012 what that is to be a, to live a life of the mind. But, you know, here we have a young, very visible, tenured professor who in some ways couldn't even exist in the academy 
you know, 30 years ago, given the kind of work that we do. Um, right. But then you have someone like Mumia who, you know, even as he's incarcerated, still holds on to this, nation, this notion that I need to have a public forum, that I need to have a public voice. Um, yeah. Really extraordinary work in that regard. I, you know, I, what really touched me very early in the book is, is when you talk about Obama. Mm. And, and given both of your very different, but still substantive critiques of Obama and the electoral process, to hear Mumia talk about how he was touched by the election. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, you know, folks don't really get what that meant historically still, you know, for African-American folks, which is still separate and distinct from our critiques and concerns about how President Obama has governed. But, right. but if it can touch someone like Mumia. Right, right. <laughs> it, it, right, exactly. You know, it speaks a great deal to this. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about that, that I think is also very extraordinary about this book Obviously, you know, besides the coming together of these two generational voices, um, but the choice to publish the book with Third World Press, mm. um, Hakeem Abudi's long, you know, independently black press, you know, and, and as I imagine it was for you, I know it was when I, when I was young to think about when I get a chance to write a book, you know, when I get a chance to write you know, a book for a third world, uh, for third world press, right? It, it had that kind of cachet for us, you know, definitely when I was younger. You know, what was it like to work with third world press in particular on this project? And did you think at all about using a different kind of press? Well, our, our agent did. <laughs> of course, right. Of course. You know, we get, we we got a, we got an earful, and I, I, I adore That's you great. know a lot of the people who support us. You know, and, and on, on on that side of things, but people were like, yo, you can get this book to Penguin and Random House. Right. There's absolutely, this absolutely. Big check. I mean, there were big checks waiting for us. Absolutely. And and Mumia's legal defense ain't free. You know what I mean? Hey, hey. And neither is my daughter's tuition. So we both <laughs> we, we we both had motivations. You know what I mean? To, to make big money. But I think both of us were more committed, honestly, to living out our politics. You know, yeah, one right, of the things right, that I'm committed right, to right. and I'm going to begin writing about more is trying to close this gap between the kind of personal uh, life lives that we live and the, and the political lives that we articulate in, in, in the public sphere. And so for me to close that gap between who I want to be and who I am or who I say I am and what, who I actually am, I had to live some of this stuff out. You know, I spent the last uh, couple of years raising money for Third World Press to help them move into this right. new phase. Right. Um, you know, so they can, and, and, and they're doing a great job of moving forward and, and with ebooks and with digital technologies and really keeping, sustaining uh, an independent black progressive voice out in the world. And so I've been raising money for them, and, and other people have been great help with that. And it was like, okay, I can't go out here and tell people to support this black institution and not destroy our ancient landmarks, and then I go out and, and sign with, and with Penguin. Like the institution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with with this book in particular, you right. know. Um, so it was, it was, we were very much committed to doing that, and we had offers from a million presses, and and, I, and we're grateful for that, you know. But it was really important for us to put it with Third World Press, um, and also on a personal side of things, just like you, I dreamed of writing a book. Yeah. On Third World Press. Well, you, you couldn't tell me nothing the first time I got that book and I saw T.W.P. on the side. I'm like, yo, I'm part of this tradition, man. Right. Because, you, know, you know, I grew up reading the ISIS papers. I Absolutely. Mahabudi's own work. I mean, yeah. You oh, know. my God. Oh, my God. Reading Haki's work. Gwendolyn Brooks on this. Pre I mean, it's just an amazing opportunity to be part of that tradition and to be part of that conversation, both with Mumia and then with all those other people. And so we're grateful for that. And Haki, you know, I mean, he, he's done everything he told me he was going to do. I, I called him and said, yo, I want to I give you a book. I promise you a book. Um, I think I got a good one for you. Because, you know, some people give the independent press a book, but they'll give them, you know, a collection of blogs they wrote. Right, right, you know, right, right, <laughs> Or right. notes they wrote on a napkin, you know. But I was like, <laughs> I will give you something that I think will help the press move forward, but also that I think honors the tradition. And, and so we gave him this book, and I said, yo, he said, just call me whenever you want to do it. It's done. I said, well, I've been working on something. It's almost done. I'm going to call you in a few months. And a few months later, I delivered a manuscript for him. That's wonderful. And, you know, and he turned it around. And, and we're proud of it. The press is proud of it. And we hope it's part of a new tradition of, of black independent, you know, publishing. A new, a new phase in the tradition of black independent publishing. You're watching yeah. Left of Black. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Mark Lamont Hill, who, of course, is an associate professor of education at Columbia University. He's the author of several books, including Beats, Rhymes, and Classroom Life, Hip Hop Pedagogy and the Politics of Identity, and most recently, The Classroom in the Cell, which was co written by Mumia Abul Jamar, Conversations on Black Life in America. Talk a little bit about what it means for you in terms of, of your career. 
Um, <laughs> well, you know, are, in, in, in some ways, you know, we're, we're always already marginalized if we're doing anything. <laughs> and, and let me just call it what it is. I mean, it, it's black shit, right? right. And, and we're always, right. always already marginalized for that kind of work. And, and, and some of our colleagues do it. Some of our colleagues choose to write about it in a way that it, it becomes validated by the academy. Yeah. You know, this is a book that, you know, doesn't earn you any points. <laughs> in all. the academy, right? They, the they don't recognize the value of it. Um, they're, you know, a little suspicious of the politics of it. Right. Um, you know, what kind of risk is associated, particularly at this stage in your career? You know, it's one thing to be, have been doing this for 35 years, you know, that long a time, and you have 17, 18 books, and your right. reputation's already set, and you decide to do a book of this nature. What does it mean? I mean, in some ways, you're not even mid-career yet, right, right. To, to make this kind of decision to do this kind of book. Yeah, it means I don't have good judgment, probably, professionally. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, never, I never cared about that stuff. I mean, right. I care about right. my career. I take the life of the mind seriously. I take my profession seriously. I'm actually uh, writing a new book right now. Uh, called Knowledge of Self, which is based on ethnographic field work I did in uh, Philadelphia, looking at uh, counter public literacy practices of black folk, everyday reading practices. I mean, it's a, it's a serious book that'll be on an Ivy League press. Uh, but I also take seriously the charge that we took, I think, um, as black folk who, who were committed to doing this kind of work, which is to speak to everyday people, right. to engage ideas and to move our agenda forward. We don't have the luxury of just talking to each other. And so that's why I engage in the public work that I do. This particular book um, is a different kind of danger. You know, just in the last week, I've gotten death threats. Yeah. I mean, the types of, I mean, the, the letters I get in, in my mailbox and my email inbox. Man, I've seen, um, the, I've seen the comment section in your blog whenever right. you write about Mumia, right? right? Or Facebook it, page, right? You know, right. So, that, so that stuff is real. Yeah. Exactly. It, it's, re it's real. I don't think people understand the level of danger that's attached to this work. And there are people who've been doing this work a lot longer than I have and who've taken a lot more risks than I have. Pam Africa, Mark Taylor. I mean, there's so many people who've taken far more risks than I have. But I am doing this work, and I think for me, it was like I have to find a way to connect to black folk in a different kind of way. And I have to find a way to get these conversations into the public conversation. And I could have done a solo book that did something like this, or I could have had a different interlocutor. I certainly could have, I could have talked to a million other uh, prominent intellectuals who could have gotten this work out. But I think there's something special about the kind of conversations Mumia and I have. And I think there's something special about the context in which we have the conversations. It's just like in the intro, you know, I, t I told Mumia, I was complaining about, you know, the, the, the tenure process, and I was saying, you know, for us as publisher parish, and he said, well, man, I'm publishing and parishing. You know, he was on yeah, death row right, at the time. Right, right, right. You know, right. that's real shit, that's you know? It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and so engaging that and letting young folks see that and hear that was so important to both of us. Um, and so for me, that that trumped any kind of risk professionally that I have to assume. I mean, is Fox News going to call me as much? Would they ever rehire me? No, I mean, I wouldn't want to go anyway, but... Would they rehire me? No, because I wrote a book with Mumia. Are there certain jobs I no longer have access to? Absolutely. Because I wrote a book right. with Mumia. Certain, certain platforms, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. And, and I think the timing of it is really important because given you know the number of young black folks, young folks in general, who got brought into this conversation about death row politics because of Troy Davis, and, right. and that was their introduction to it. So they don't know about someone like Mumia. They've never read his work. Right. This is a chance for those politics now to be recentered in their lives and, and for them to have much more of a sustained commitment to those politics instead of, you know, just that kind of momentary flourishing that we saw with Troy Davis. Absolutely. And it, it adds a la la layer and level of texture and nuance to the conversation. It, it adds a real person to the conversation. By the time we got involved in Troy Davis, we were in the fourth quarter with, with you know, with, with seconds ticking yeah. down. Yeah. With Mumia, it's a different kind of movement. And by en engaging a death row inmate in that conversation, we were able to perhaps organize folk and, and, and actually move forward toward a political project that tells people that the state is executing its citizens, most of whom look like you and me, most of whom are, you know, 18 to 25, 18 to 30, and that we have to do something about that. And I think that's important. It's also important to underscore the humanity of folks who are living in these dungeons, because so easily we just think of them as chattels, so easily we just think of them as objects. But when we have somebody like Mumia, who is articulating brilliance in every way, you know, we get something else. You know, that, that's what Dylan Rodriguez was talking about in his fascinating mm -hmm. book, Forced mm -hmm. Passages. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if, we can, if we can hear that kind of, those kind of voices and we can see that kind of work coming out of prisons, I think it matters. And lastly, man, I, I, think, it, I think it matters for people to hear two black men in public 
having conversations about their fears, their anxieties, their mistakes. Yeah. I mean, all yeah. of that stuff is, yeah. is important too, and and not and rare. It's just it's just rare. You know, there there's so many studies that talk about the, the childhood development of, of black boys, particularly in terms of schooling and and how they do these surveys. And so many black boys say they've never seen a black man read. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. never right. seen a black man read a book before. So the idea that you could have two black men, two generations, really having the kind of conversation that we're having is extraordinary. Uh, did, were there any, any things that surprised you about Mumia as you got to know him more, got to talk to him, you know, off stage, if you will? Yeah. Anything about him or the conversation surprised you? You know, so many things. First of all, the first thing you, you, you realize about Mumia is that he is hilarious and silly and one of the most sort of fun-loving people you would ever meet. You know, the first time I went to see him, you know, I'm expecting him to be, you know, like a political, I mean, he's a political prisoner. He's been on death row. You're expecting that voice prisoner. you hear on the radio. Yeah, <laughs> right, you know what I mean? And you know what, if the nigga's on death row, he's, he's entitled to be a little serious, right. you know? So I'm like, you know, I, I go in there expecting him to be this serious dude, and you know, he's, he's, stand, he's, standing, he's standing there looking at me, he's like, yo, what's up, man? Because we're talking through glass. <laughs> then. About 10 seconds later, he launches into this impersonation of Al Sharpton. <laughs> then he does his impersonation of, uh, of, of the, the time Governor Everett Dell. You know, then he's just joking and telling stories about the people who visit him, and we just laughing and crying. He, he has the most, it, it, I don't even know how to describe it, but this death, he has his death row humor. I guess you call it gallows humor. He has his gallows humor. Yeah. That is, I mean, it'll literally have you cry and laugh, and then you almost feel bad <laughs> that you laugh laughing until he reassures you that it's okay, that there's a tragic comic sensibility to it that he appreciates. So, so I mean, seeing that side of him was so important because he always seemed so hard, you know what I mean? And when you see that side of him, it, it reminds you that he's a person. You know, I can think of times where I was on the phone, he said, yo, you don't sound good, you're sick. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And before I know, he's mailing me something, either yeah. instructions on how to feel better, or he's mailing me a get well card with a hand-painted drawing of, of, of Zora Neale Hurston on the cover. I mean, just, it's just a certain way that he is. And then you realize that he has sadness, man. Yeah. You know, I, we call, I called him um, in December uh, and of last year and his voice didn't sound right. And I kept asking him what it was and, and he didn't really want to talk about it. And he always is upbeat. And when we got off the phone, it kind of hit me and he confirmed it later that, you know, he was like, yo, it's the holidays, man. You know, right. and you don't think about that when you think of political prisoners and symbols, right. you think right. of like Che and, Fidel. you know, you don't think of people who have like feelings and, 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 and desires. And, and to hear him talk about missing his family and to hear him talking about, you know, wanting to be home and obviously having the, the reminder of his arrest was painful for him. And to hear all that and see all that, I think was important, man. And, and, and also to see his extraordinary talent, man. Not only is he a talented artist, he just started uh, writing operas in the last year or two, um, stuff that he never was able to do outside of prison. He's, 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 he's begun <laughs> well, to do inside yeah, of prison. Right. Man. Right, re reanimating, re uh, you know, this re <laughs> you know, changing the nature of the space to do other kind of work. I mean, that's, that's, exactly that's amazing right. stuff. Uh, we're here with Mark Lamont Hill, well-known contributor to Fox News, commentator, author, talking about his brand new book, The Classroom in the Cell: Conversation in the Black America, that was written with Mumia Abu Jamal. Uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit before I let you go. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, of course, has just been tapped to host. Uh, a weekend show on MSNBC, yes. Melissa Harris Perry, and, and congratulations to her, of course. I'm happy. Um, but you know, with that announcement, of course, has come some very real criticism of her, uh, hate, if you will, um, you know, in some quarters, and, and a, as a general criticism for the idea of, of a black public intellectual. It, it, you know, if there's anything that you, any advice you, you know, because between your experiences from being a regular contributor you know, years back on Fox News, and, and also, of course, now hosting Our Voices uh, with Black Enterprise. Uh, you know, is there any advice you would give to her in terms of trying to navigate this space of trying to do important work in this televisual vein, but at the same time trying to find that balance, you know, to teach the classes, to be productive, to answer the folks who think that somehow, you know, we can't do what we do and do multiple things at the same time. Exactly. I mean. <laughs> I think the first thing you have to do is, and this is something Michael Eric Dyson told me as my mentor when I was finishing grad school, he said, just always do your work, right. you know, and, and, and that's a basic tenet, right? As long as you're doing your work, they can't say anything else. If yeah. all you're doing is the other stuff, right. then you have that's a problem. problem. Right. Melissa just put out Sister Citizen, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's it. <laughs> right, on Yale University Press, she's a full professor at Tulane. 
you know, if anybody knows about doing their work, it's her. I mean, right. she she's done her work. She continues to do her work. She's working on another project. She's about to run a center on, on, on women in politics in the South. Right. She's doing her work. So her, long her activist do, commitment to what's ha been happening in New Orleans post-Katrina. Exactly. I mean, right. yeah. she's, she's been doing activist work in, in New Orleans. She's been doing uh, work with the Obama uh, administration. She managed, she's managed political campaigns all around this country. I mean, she's living public intellectual life, and she was doing it before she had TV. And, and, and raising a daughter, right? right. And raising a daughter, <laughs> which is a full-time job right. raising a wonderful beautiful black girl so you know when you see all that stuff happening you you, you have to say okay some of that is just hate because melissa's doing the work, the work. she's right. doing her work um she's doing a weekend show she's not doing uh, she's not covering nine to three anchor on anchor post on msnbc she's doing a weekend show similar to what i do right. I'm, i take you know maybe four or five days a, a month you know, I tape a bunch of episodes at once, and I spend the rest of my time being a full-time professor, just like Melissa's going to do, and just like Melissa has been doing. So you can shake some of that stuff off. The thing that you have to be concerned with, and I think Melissa does an excellent job of this, is that you don't want, you want to remain a freedom fighter and yeah. not become a celebrity. Yeah. You might be somebody whose work is celebrated, right. but you don't want to become a celebrity intellectual, because celebrity intellectuals are about the fame. They're, they're, right. It's no different than somebody coming on and advertising their new movie. Committed public intellectuals are people who may have the public eye and the public attention, but never lose sight of a freedom struggle and are always connected to the public and its problems. Right. So for me, that means that on my show, even though I may have to have celebrities on a show and it's not just hardcore politics, I ask them different questions. I have different right. conversations. Or, or you, know, you I, have Angela Davis on, right? I mean, when's the last time anybody has seen Angela Davis on anything that even smacks of mainstream television? Right, and I have her, you know, Angela Davis got seen by a million people on my show right. talking about, and we talking about prison abolition. We weren't talking about her afro, we talking about prison <laughs> abolition. You know what I'm saying? That, that's real work. We, we can create a context for different conversations. What Melissa's going to do on MSNBC, I know, is create a different context for conversation. She's going to ask questions that aren't normally asked on mainstream TV. We're not going to ask, is Obama a terrorist? Or why isn't Obama a terrorist? We're not going to stay at that baseline boilerplate level. We're going to go deeper yeah. and ask complicated questions. And I think between her and Chris Hayes on, on Saturday and Sunday mornings, it's going to be the smartest three or four hours on, on <laughs> television. Yeah. Anywhere. <laughs> and that's important. And so when people say, and, and, and Boyce Watkins wrote a piece um, on Melissa harris Perry, you know, basically saying, uh, offering all these critiques of Melissa and why it's, it's messed up that she's uh, on uh, MSNBC and why she's getting the show. And I think Boyce was dead wrong. And Boyce is my dude. But it, it sounded like hating to me. Yeah. You know, and th that, that I call a spade a spade. And he, I think he might agree he's hating a little bit. Right, right. And, and, and a little bit of sexism that's in there, too. I mean, that can't be dismissed in, 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 in all of this critique also. Absolutely. Of, of course. Because I don't get the, the kind of critique I'll get for doing what I do is different than what Melissa Melissa's will get, get right. for doing that right. stuff. Skip Gates has been hosting documentaries on PBS for, for a decade and a half. Right. He hasn't said nothing. Partly because we're scared of Skip, you know, he's the, <laughs> the poorly owner of, of this operation. But partly because he's a man and we just have a different kind of critique of folk like Absolutely. Skip. Absolutely. Or who has a radio show with Tavis or whomever. We've been joined this afternoon by Professor Mark Lamont Hill. One other quick question. How's baby girl doing with the swimming? Oh, my God. They're not up to your, your daughter's levels. Your daughters are like Olympians, you know what I mean? But, but she's good, man. You know, it, it was a great lesson to teach her to mm -hmm. hold on. She didn't like it at first, you know, but I wanted to make sure she could swim because most black kids can't swim. I right. can't swim right. even right. still. Right. You know, I get nervous in the shower. So I was like, I'm going to make sure that she learns how to swim. And she's held on to it. She loves it now. And she calls herself a swimmer, man. Oh, that's great. That's so watching her go into second grade as a swimmer. You remember when I was carrying her? <laughs> yeah, I remember, man. So, so to see that, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so proud. Every week I got the, the iPhone with the video camera. <laughs> taking her to do flaps, man. And I'm, 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 I couldn't be prouder, man. And, and again, thank you for being a model of what it means to be a father and an, an engaged parent, but particularly a, a father as a black male in this in this space, man. I learned so many lessons from you, and I'm so grateful for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Mark. It's great talking to you as always. Looking forward to your future work. Looking forward to most mo folks getting the chance to read The Classroom in the Cell because it is incredible work that you've done with Mumia here. And shout out to Mumia for us the next time Absolutely. You talk next interview, he's going to be here with me, and we're going to do it together. <laughs> that would be fantastic, man. That would be fantastic, man. Take care. Love you, bro.
produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.